Welcome to the Catalyst Life Coaching Podcast with John Kim and Noelle Cordeaux. If you're inspired to begin your own life coaching practice or just want to learn a little bit more about what it's all about, visit journey.co. That's J R N I dot co for more information. Your adventure awaits. Hey guys, on today's episode of the Catalyst Life Coaching Podcast, we're going to talk about life and death and grieving and all the stuff that comes with um, living here on planet Earth. Well, (laughs) yes, big topics, big topics and good topics for today. And John, I want to first thank you for the way that you create content by sharing your own journey and your own lived experience with everybody who listens to your podcasts, reads your work, and you do a beautiful job of it. So thank you for that generous gift. Oh, thank you. I, um, I appreciate that. That means a lot. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think actually real quick, that's the only way to make it sustainable and to not make it fake because whatever's happening in your life, um, is truth. And so to put it out there, it's just a great start is to start with something that's honest. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's happening in your life? How did this topic come up in our recent episodes? What's going on? Um, So my dad has been sick for a while. And um, in the last, uh, I don't know, maybe last three weeks to a month, um, he started to um, uh, get really bad. He ended up falling a, a cracking his back that turned that turned into a surgery and then in the surgery he had a cardiac arrest so like his heart stopped so he so he technically died but then he came back to life and then you know he turned into a vegetable and one of my greatest fears um was having a parent who was alive but dead you know was alive but couldn't do anything and then having the my my other parents uh, have to 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 be the caretaker and, you know, and the impact of that. So um, he was headed that direction. And then uh, he lasted about three days and then he passed. So mm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear of all of that and the passing of your dad and the stress and the tumult and all of the ripples yeah. that experience had. Thank so, you. yeah, I had a, um, I was lucky I had a moment because, you know, you never know when people are going to go and um I was going to visit him, but I wasn't. It was one of those weird days where I was like, yeah, should I go? No, I'll just go tomorrow. Uh, And then I ended up just going, and um, I had my moment with him. Uh, I held his hand, and it was the first time I saw a person cry without um, um, hearing anything. So he wasn't able to talk, but he was crying. Like So you just look at his eyes, and and you see the tears falling, and – home it was just it's it's a really (laughs) such a powerful moment and then um and and then just me talking to him uh petting his head holding his hand and uh so i had that connection and then the next day he passed so i'm glad i actually went and saw him that day wow that's really profound yeah that's really profound and the thing that i was reminded of listening to you was the the very definition of love, Mm -hmm. which from a neurobiological perspective involves eye contact. Yes. You held with your father. And in that moment is a mutual agreement for care. Yeah. You know, that's the first time I've ever experienced love without words. And Mm -hmm. it was just as much, if not more powerful, meaning um, you know, the, 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 I don't know, 20 seconds of staring into someone's eyes and uh, holding their hand and seeing the emotion and, 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 uh, what they're feeling through their eyes. I've never experienced that in my life. And so that was, that was pretty, it was amazing. I mean, we didn't say one word. That's uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, yeah. profound, it's real, it's all encompassing. And when we talk about emotions, when we talk about positive emotions, love is the all-encompassing positive emotion that has the greatest impact on changing us. Yes, absolutely. What are you noticing now on the other side of this experience? 
Um, I, I actually have a lot of closure. I mean, you know, I, I, um, I had a couple days where I, I think that nothing will will shift your perspective or give you new lenses, uh, or or shuffle your your life uh, life deck and and whatever you feel is really important. Kind of uh, those cards are on top uh, faster than life or death. So whether a baby is born or you lose someone. Um, I think in that moment, you, you are able to pull back in, in the things that you were worried about or all your concerns or, you know, or the people that you haven't forgiven. All of that, it's just so easy to just put things come into perspective very fast <laughs> of what's important. It's true. It's very true. And um, I know that you've been going through this with your dad. And then in my own life, um, I'm I'm really going through it with friends and extended family. Mm. Um, one one death due to uh, addiction, right. another due to cancer, and then I have a really dear friend of mine that has um, terminal cancer, and it was just so sudden. And the you know healthy forty year old guy wow. and told to get his affairs in order. And so I'm literally this week waiting for the phone call from him that's mm. going to be our goodbye. How do you um, deal with loss? How does it affect you or how has it been? Well, when I first got the news of my friend, um, it was a physical impact. I... Mm pretty good with stress. I'm pretty resilient. I face and I deal with very high levels of stress on a regular basis, but this really knocked me and I actually physically crumpled. I I fell over onto my couch and I cried. I couldn't help it. I physically broke down. Yeah. Um, And I think it was, it was for me, it was the impact of this is too soon. Right. Right. I had, and on selfishly, I had planned on having this person in my life until the end. And I now know that that's not going to happen. And God, the grief of it. You seem, you, you seem like someone who um, feels it in, in uh, her body. Yeah, I'm very connected to somatic responses. And yeah. when I was thinking about this conversation that we were going to have today, um, somatic response is is really important. Your, your first indicator of what's going on below the surface typically shows up in your body. Mm-hmm. It's your throat, it's your stomach, it's the back of your neck, it's your back, it's wherever you feel stress and tension. And I've been working with this stuff for so long that I'm very in tune with my somatic responses and they come out of me like crazy. Yeah. Are you able to see, um, because there, there's been many passings in your life, uh, are you able to see beauty in death? I'm starting to change my relationship with death. Yeah. And it's be, been of necessity and I think probably getting older that when I was younger and I experienced death, I probably just really took on the emotions of other adults around me right. who were experiencing grief without really understanding it. Um, my mother-in-law who's faced quite a bit of loss in her life said, you know, the worst thing about this is that you just never get to hang out with that person again. Yeah, exactly. Um, I actually said this in, in the services uh, toward the end. My dad would call me um, often, two or three times a week, and he would just call and say, "Hey, h- how are you doing?" And, and I would say, "Okay." He's like, "You know, um, what are you doing?" And I'm just like, "Oh, you know, I'm doing my stuff." He doesn't know exactly what I do, and then I and then he would just hang up. And the <laughs> the old John Kim it, that would bother the shit out of me, and it would it would be why I would send him the voicemail. Or he would want me to come over and like uh, you know put the batteries into his uh, remote control or whatever. Um, but toward the end, I actually started to get curious. Like I detached myself from you know our history, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. 
Um, and it kind of reminded me of you because I think this is something you would do is to actually see, observe something and notice it and be a witness to it. And I, and I was like, oh, he's, he's calling. He's calling more than ever. And he's just saying, how are you? Are you good? And then he's hanging up. And I thought to myself, um, there's no right way to love someone. You know, this is his way of trying to connect because he knows he's going to die soon. Yeah. And he wanted to know how you were doing. Yeah. (laughs) And he he wanted to know you're good. It just didn't come in the form of what I expected. uh, But once I accepted, that was his way of saying, you know, I love you um, or I'm thinking about you. Then it meant something, you know. Yeah. So I want to run through some fun facts with you and we can fact check them against our own experience. So people who have close experiences with death report that their values completely shift, that their values become more attuned to appreciation for life Mm -hmm. and increased concern for others. And then there's also a decreased concern about impressing others and a decrease in materialism. Oh, yeah, I definitely 100%. 100%. I, I, I sense that the first day. You know how, um, and, and you experience this too, you know, just our workload and, you know, we, we both get, you know, 100 emails a day and I've all these little stresses and emails about podcasts and all this, all this stuff. Uh, when my dad passed, um, the next day, none of that mattered. <laughs> no, zero. <laughs> like, I mean, not that, you know, I didn't want to be productive or anything, but it just, it just, it didn't mean anything, you know? It changes. It, it changes. changed. Yeah. It changed. And I had the same experience when I got the news of my friend. I exploded with almost derision towards all of the things that were stressing me out, right. like bills or retirement planning or, you know, the status quo. And I got angry at it. And I said, you know, what's the point of all of this stuff if yeah. it so fast. You mean the, the, um, the daily grind and all the to do's on our list and, and all that, right? Or more so the, the levels of guilt and fear and pressure that come with them. My tasks are pretty joyful. You know, I like to work. I like to work hard. Mm. The what's, you know, typically on the other end of that stuff is what will happen if you don't. Right. Right. What will happen if you don't work hard and execute all these tasks? And that's what I got mad at mm. because it's so false to me. So when I was reading, I learned that having experiences with death correspond to a higher quest for meaning. Yes. Yeah, it's absolutely. You you actually reevaluate what's important to you. And then, you know, you, you shuffle your cards and what you want on top um, it, it are the, the meaning cards, the, the, the people and the things that are meaningful to you that instantly floats to the top when someone dies. And I think people are scared to get into having these conversations with folks because we dance around it. Yeah. You know, death has is such a, um, I don't know specter, you know, and that might be an ironic term in our lived consciousness of, you know, what is death? It's Scrooge. It's the gravestone. It's spirits. It's, you know, the end of your time on this earth. And there's a lot of religiosity associated with it. But when we really get down to it, you don't have to be afraid as a coach or even as a friend to talk about this with your people because it's a way of honoring folks. And it's a way of their experience and a really uh, healthy thing to do is to find out from your friends or from your clients who are experiencing death how this changes their values. Yeah, and I think that's why there's um, a room or there's a a huge space uh, for grieving coaches, coaches who can help you through the process of, of grieving. That is a huge field, and even uh, one step further, end-of-life coaching is Mm. blowing up as an industry, and we need solid practitioners in that arena big time, big time. Yeah, I think it's important. I think it's imperative um, to actually talk about this stuff. I I think it's helpful. I think the worst thing you can do is – uh, if someone passes that you love and it affects you and you say nothing and you just try to white knuckle it, uh, I think you can easily um, 
go into a depression. I think you could uh, feel a sense of hopelessness. I think uh, it's easy when someone dies to know that there is a ticking clock, that life isn't forever. And there's this kind of, uh, it could easily, instead of being beautiful, it could be uh, a sense of doom and suddenly you're depressed and you're not functioning. Yes. And of course, everybody turns the lens on themselves and then begins to consider their own mortality. Right, right, right. And then, when will the clock run out? Yeah. And then I think uh, it could, something great could happen from that, meaning, um, you know, uh, searching for things that matter, uh, letting go of things that didn't, all of that stuff. Or it could go the other way and it can drown you, <laughs> you know? It can. So if we're going to spin it into the positive and we're going to capitalize on the experience as a friend or as a coach, you know, when you're talking to someone um, and I'll ask you, John, so, you know, you just had this experience with your father. That sounds really beautiful. What would you like the end of your own life to be like? Oh, wow. Um. Well, well, when I go, I, I don't want to. So when I when I said my speech, so I, I was the only person in my family because my my brother didn't want to do it, my mom didn't want to do it, so they they told me to do it. Um, I didn't want it to be like this dark, uh, so sad tragedy. Tragedy. I, I wanted it to be um, almost like a celebration of life without without that being too inappropriate. And so um, the, my speech was angled uh, where it was kind of light and fun, and I appreciated, um, you know, the, the, some of the, the amazing stuff that he, that, that, uh, he was uh, and, and how that rippled into me. Uh, for example, my inappropriateness that comes directly from my dad and how it doesn't, that doesn't have to be a bad thing. And so w when, I, when I pass, I don't want it to be like a dark thing. I almost want it to be like a celebration of life. That's beautiful. Yeah. Who do you want to be connected to? Who do you want around you? And what do you need to start doing now to make sure that your vision is realized? Oh, man. Um, I guess starting with um, the people I love. So, you know, intimate partner, friends and family, and letting them know that if I pass, um, this is the tone you know the the you know it's interesting you asked this question. I think the tone of the the funeral and all of that to me that's more important than like where you're buried or if you're cremated or like all of that stuff like i I really think the um the ritual um of how someone goes and 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 the way that you know the world um projects that I think that's important. I think that's what we remember, you know, not if someone is cremated or buried or whatever, but um what they're there, uh, whether it was a celebration or something just super dark and and heavy. Oh, yeah. And for me, what's really jumping out is the relationship piece mm. that in order to be celebrated, in order to be remembered, in order for there to be a party, there needs to be people there. Yep. And so uh, when I was thinking about this, the thing that was really crazy for me is I've always said that um, when I go, I want to be put in um, a hot pink, like flower type. <laughs> Love okay. it. And I want Love my it. family to, um, to put me out on the dining room table during holidays. <laughs> Oh God! Every holiday you're out there. Oh yeah, I want to be at the table. I love food. I oh, love God. I love celebration. I want to be at the table as a hot pink plastic flower, possibly a palm tree. I don't know. We'll we get there. The movie that's coming to mind is Weekend at Bernie's. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. But with Noel. Yeah, and so for me, um, whenever I would have this vision previously, it would be my children that would do this, but. I have decided I'm not going to have kids. I'm not going to be a mother. I'm mm -hmm. not going to be a parent. So the question that I have now is, well, who's going to put me on the table mm. if that's not the case? Right. And so, you know, I'm starting to really redefine my relationships and redefine what family means to me and what yeah. community means to me. 
and lean into non-traditional uh, chosen family members who will be there. Yeah. I love it. I love how different um, our endings are going to be. Yes. <laughs> but you know, that, that's very you, and I'm not surprised at all. Um, and I think that's great. I, I, I think that the fact that we um, want to do things that's completely different and not the norm is what makes us us, and I celebrate that. Absolutely. And again, you know, for you who are listening out there, don't be afraid to have these conversations with folks who are suffering. A lot of times deaths come, the funeral happens, and then we all go about our everyday lives. But for the people who have lost someone, it continues and it continues every day. So check in on your friends and family a month from now, two months from now, six months from now, a year from now uh, to ask how they're doing, to ask what they need in order to support their own values that have shifted and how you can show up and really participate in somebody's life because that's the point is to do it while we're all living. Yeah, super important. And also don't allow or don't wait for a death to happen for you to reevaluate what's important in your life. Um, that, that should be a weekly thing, you know, and um, forgive who you need to forgive, let go of what you need to let go of and um, – put all the weight on what's meaningful to you absolutely all right guys be well 